if you happen to come to the ER, you know that that's not a good place to be in. Uh, the emergency departments are becoming over and overcrowded, and there's tons of patients, very limited resources and time. Uh, and in, in this conference language, we might want to say that dealing with patients in the ER is not optimal, okay? Uh, and this is what uh, we came, and this is what my uh, study, this project is talking about. Uh, but I will start in a different story. Um, no, I'm, I'm not going to start with a different story, I'm going to start with this. So when you come to the ER, the first thing you see is the triage nurse, is the, the triage area where the nurse uh, try, based on your uh, condition and the resources available, to determine whether you need life-saving treatment or not, they will uh, give you an emergency survey, so severity index, the ESI. And this goes something like this. If uh, a patient is dying, he will get one. Uh, if you're not dying, so it depends on uh, whether it can wait or not. And then if it can wait, so your score is more a, a matter of how many uh, resources the hospital has. And a spoiler here is that most patients get three. This score uh, in turn go to the clinicians and physicians who further examine the patients and decide whether they need to go to a life sa to a life saving uh, procedure to acute care or go to other patient uh, to other exams and more medical uh, tests and then uh, you you go all to the entire flow of the hospital before release. But our story starts far, far away at Intuit uh, in Hoda Sharon. And this is where I work as a data scientist. And Intuit has uh, financial, uh, financial uh, products like TurboTax, QuickBooks, uh, Mint. And we work with uh, 46 million customers in different locations around the world and try to help the small businesses and customers to improve their financial lives. And you might want to know why is Intuit doing, what is Intuit doing in the ER. In the middle here, you can see Sigalit. Sigalit is a colleague of mine. She's also a data scientist. And her story is an example of how a personal story can really impact a lot of uh, the, your surroundings. Her mom, she had to go for, through an operation, a life-saving operation. And uh, Sigalit was really minded about this. And due to her mom's... Uh, condition, she started thinking, what can I do as an AI research to help my mom, to help to do something for her? And she started looking around her and she found uh, many doctors that did something that has to do with this condition. And after a few rounds of talking to them and understanding uh, their needs, we decided to come up with this hackathon uh, together with, with the Iftach and uh, Eyal that you can see there. And we just, uh, uh, she came to me, and I was super excited about it, because my PhD is in uh, computational neuroscience, and I did uh, diagnose, uh, I used machine learning to diagnose the psychiatric patients. So if there's one thing that I'm more curious about than data science is data science in medicine. And she came to me, she told me, what do you think, uh, do you want to take all of your volunteer hours, we have like three days a year in it, into it, take this and come with me, we'll go to to Shiba and we'll do some kind of a medical research. She did the same with uh, many people in, in our AI group. And uh, it ended as three days hackathon, 14 doctors and uh, six doctors, 14 data science and engineers sitting together in one room trying to solve uh, emergency department problems. And the Innovation Center from uh, Shiba did an amazing job. And they gathered uh, EMRs from different departments. They did a lot of processing to get this data. And we came up with five years worth of data for over 500,000 uh, patients. Um, and this was really incredible. So as a data scientist, I sit there and there's so many interesting questions you can ask, so many uh, things that you can uh, model. Uh, and we, we really started to think, so what, what is the best problem, and the, the biggest problem that we can solve? How can we treat it? How are we going to model it? How are we going to embed these features? And what are we going to do about this? But then you sit around with the doctors and you get some kind of a... They're looking at, at us. They're not really sure what are we talking about. And we need to make the, the discussion something that everybody can join. And their patient of this data that we are looking at is something like this. I have a patient. He might be dying. I don't know. There's 
10 like him waiting in line and I need to save their, their life. There's no time and no resources. What do I do? So as a data scientist, this is not the type of questions and type of urgency that we are used to be working on. But we sat together and we tried to think, okay, so, so we have three days. We have, you have our resources. What can we do? What can we do to make your life easier? And we came up with this uh, ideal state of the doctor. So as soon as someone enters the ER, I want to be able to say uh, if they need life-saving treatment or not. That can help, my, do, help me do my job a bit better. So let's take this uh, sentence and decompose it in order to better understand the framework of the problem that we are trying to solve. As soon as someone enters the ER, the ER, we want to be looking at the triage area. Okay, so everything that goes after is not interesting, it's data. We want to focus on life-saving treatment. So we want to actually uh, make the clinic, clinician decision, the physician, unnecessary. So when someone enters, we can tell, go here or go there without further uh, staff involved. So we drop all of this and we just want to know life-saving treatment, not life-saving treatment. Now, we want to know if they need, not if they got life-saving treatment. So our target label is not where did this patient go, is whether he died after uh, visiting the ER. So our, tar our target in this example was after entering the ER, uh, whether the uh, mortality after two days and it doesn't matter uh, if they were discharged or not discharged. We just want to look at their mortality. And we also looked at short-term, long-term uh, mortality. So short-term will be um, from two days to one month. And long-term will be three to uh, one month to three months after entering the ER. Another important aspect of defining the problem would be what is the cost of missing out. So the true positive here would say that someone got the, patient, the, the treatment they need. A false positive means someone might die because they didn't get the treatment they need. Well, a false negative would, a false, yeah, a false negative would mean that someone got uh, some kind of treatment and there was some waste of resource and money, but it's not that big of a deal. So we need to take, to keep into mind that precision and recall is much more important, sensitivity and recall is much more important than uh, having some false positives. Okay, so this was the beginning of our work. We needed to understand what is the problem we are trying to solve. And now we want to start th thinking, what is the best solution? And now this is the problem. Are you familiar with this phrase? Okay. As a data scientist, my hammer is usually a model, a machine learning model. If, if I can use a deep learning model, it's even better. And this is the way I, I want to, this is the Googles that I look on, uh, on things from, okay? I have a problem, it's a classification problem. I can look at the, the data, some of it is time series. I can do some embedding. There's a lot, of th a lot of things that I can do there and I will solve this problem. But if we take into account the doctor's perspective, what they really need is something to help them in the ER. It's not necessarily a model. We are there as data scientists. We have other tools that we can use and other stuff that we can offer. So these are some of the, the what, what does succeeding in this hackathon means? First of all, if you can uh, evaluate and validate some of the existing measures, think that they can use right now, this will be a success. Second, if we, if we design a machine learning model and we can see that it outperformed this model, so uh, outperformed this benchmark, this is another success. And also, if we can get anything that is practical and can be used as insights. Uh, we tend to think that uh, only if we do something that is complicated, it's important, but some of the stuff that we do like this, just in the data exploration, for some people, it can be very, very useful. So we also kept these uh, metrics in mind, and now we started uh, looking uh, one by one. So first of all, to evaluate the existing metrics, there are three metrics, uh, that three indexes that are used to predict mortality, that they have some, uh, they ha they're discussed in the literature, they're not really used so much in the ER because it's not, uh, 
indicative enough, or I'm, I'm not sure why they're not using it too much in the ER. It's a shock index, which is the heart rate, uh, divided by the systolic blood pressure, a modified version of it, and also one that takes into account the age, uh, the ASI. And this is uh, most more or less what uh, the literature uh, predicted. They only tested it on short-term mortality, two days. And uh, you see that the AUC is something around 0 0.6 for uh, most of them. And we just took these indexes because we had this, had this data, and we checked what, it hap what happened if you do this for uh, five years' worth of data. And we thought it did a bit better than what the literature actually reports. And we also see that the age uh, is very, very uh, significantly better than the others. And if, if we think in terms of AUC, AUC we didn't, do, uh, we didn't uh, write any model, any code. We just took these two measures and we can get to up to 1.87 uh, area under the curve, which is pretty imp impressive. And this is already a success of uh, this work if we hadn't done anything else. The reason age is so important is because mortality goes up with age, as you can see in this graph. And this also gives you some kind of an, a thinking that we might want to have a different triage, a different uh, way of looking at patients when they come in different uh, age groups. So now we wanted to know if we can uh, develop some kind of a model that will beat this benchmark. The data we had was uh, data from the triage, including the vital signs, the uh, lab, lab tests that they have in the ER, uh, just as, as soon as you enter the ER, I'm not talking about the later tests. Uh, some of the demographics they had on patients, uh, chronic drugs and background disorder and disease. I'm, I'm used to psychiatry, so I say background disorders. Uh, we also know something about uh, what happened when a patient enters the ER. So when, was, when did they come? Um, what was their chief complaint? How did they arrive? W whether was it uh, by ambulance or did they arrive by themselves? This is also a valuable information. And of course, if someone already visited the ER, so we can tell something about their previous visits. So here we can uh, use a lot of so sort of aggregated features on how many times they already uh, came to the ER, or what was uh, the summary of their previous hosp hospitalization, and so on. This is something to take also for other models that y use a point in time. Uh, always remember that there's the past, and you can use the past and integrate it in your model in some sense. So the first law of data scientists, garbage in, garbage out, everybody familiar? Okay, so my model is only as good as my data is. And in this sense, we had a really great opportunity to sit together with the domain experts and do the data pre-processing. Usually we just go to this uh, fraud analyst and I ask him, okay, so just, I wanna make sure I understand what this field mean and just let me know how can I uh, group these categories and you don't really get to really sit with them for a day and a half and just pre-process the data together. And I think this was a really good lesson for me of how important this is. We tend to kind of uh, think, think that it's not that crucial, but it is. So uh, what we did, you, did we do? For example, for the main diagnosis, we had to know uh, whether, whether someone had uh, any one of the common disease, this, uh, diseases. So we looked at this their uh, information and it's, it's like spread around the data. Some of it's in the reception, some of it in, it's in the uh, back background and some of this is uh, in the ICD codes represented as numbers and in other places it's just uh, all, all sort of words which all mean the same things and, and based on the doctor they just look at it and, and they say okay this and this and this it's all the same let's just put this as one variable. Another thing ranking categorical var variables so and the way people come to the hospital can be crucial, but uh, ambulance and uh, shacham is the same thing. So they can group this together, but they, they can tell us, okay, this is high risk, lower risk, lower, uh, if someone just come by themselves, we can rank this as zero. And we can use this information and feed this to our model. Uh, dimensionality reduction. Instead of doing drug embedding in an automated way, we, we started doing this actually in the hackathon. We started doing all sort of embeddings and then one of the doctors says, hey, I found this uh, really great data source where I can look at each, each drug and map it into their uh, sub, uh, pharma, pharmacological uh, subgroup and this reduces our dimension from 5,000 to 200 in a very meaningful way. 
And of course, manually remove, remove outlayers. So we know that poles can be in this range of uh, values or heart rate cannot uh, exceed the 300. Okay, so now to the model, just nothing really, really complicated here. We used CAT boost. And uh, for those of you who's not familiar with it, this is a variation of XGBoost, which handles beautifully categorical variables. I really recommend you go read this paper, understand what it does. It outperforms, in our case, uh, both Random Forest and XGBoost. Uh, our labels were very unbalanced, and in, in uh, CatBoost, as well as XGBoost and other scikit-learn uh, packages, so you, you, there is a pause scale weight. So you can just tune it uh, in reverse to, to the ratio of, uh, of labels. So if in our case, for example, it was 1 to, to, to 1,000 uh, for early mortality, so something like 500 could work well, but also just 100 or 50 could work as well. So we did this as part of our hyper-tuning. And then I remind you that I said that we used aggregated features in order to aggregate features from the past. So it's really, really important to make sure that our training and our cross-validation and our uh, parameter tuning is done in a time, in a chronolo chronological order. Okay, so we don't want uh, to have any da data leakage. So the train set was uh, until 2017. 2017 was the test. And then we just... For the, we use this uh, time split from uh, scikit-learn, for cross-validation time split, to do a grid search that each time we train on the past and test on the futures, on the future. So I remind you what, we, what the problem was that we were trying to solve. As soon as someone enters the ER, we can tell whether they need life-saving treatment or not. We were able to show that, uh, to, to compare and evaluate different existing measures, and our model outperformed all of the existing measures by far. So it says uh, 1.96 uh, AUC. And, and of course, we did best for uh, short-term mortality, but we did well also for, um, for early mortality, but we did well also for short-term and long-term mortality. I will not go into this. And we also got some practical insights. We can look at the av available indexes and I draw a threshold of where they really, uh, they, where they can determine uh, in a very, very, very high level of confidence whether someone needs acute surgery, acute uh, care. We can look at the feature importance and we can see that the early mortality is mainly characterized by uh, things that has to do with the current state, like blood pressure and uh, heart rate and the chief complaint, what happened to the patient right now, while long and short-term mortality are more, uh, the, the, f the main features were more of the history, of the background, the previous visits, and this can be useful for other models, like if I want to see uh, on discharge what happens to the patient and to make sure that they get uh, the best uh, drugs and treatment that they need. And what did I learn? So first of all, don't go to the ER. Avoid it if you can. Second, I learned that a personal story can really bring to a significant impact. Uh, just take like a five minutes away from your day-to-day -day jo day -day job. Look around you. Maybe there's someone there that needs your super uh, data science powers and can really gain from your work. And maybe you can learn something out of it. And it even might be your next job. So it's worthwhile. worthwhile. And the, I think the most important lesson for me was to be very, very customer obsessed when I work on data science project. We are usually very far away from our clients or from the users, the people consuming our models. And when you sit together in the same room and work on, on the problem, first it, it keeps you focused on the big things. You don't wander around to many things. Sometimes you use less of your data, but you solve bigger problems. And you also look beyond the, the, the metrics that we're used to working with, like the precision, the AUC, the ROC, the F-score, whatever it is that our managers are really interested in. And we really want to know where we can put value into our cost consumer's life. I'm not saying customers, or consumer's life, the people who work with our models in the end. So I think this was very, very valuable for me. And I can summarize this in one picture. So if this is the client, the, the person who asks you to, to create the model, so this may be the PM or the reviewer of your next paper or someone from the business unit, and you're, you're creating this beautiful mobile and they love it and everybody, you're so happy about it. But then you 
want to switch your uh, perspective and look from your user side, and this is what you see. And I will end with that. <laughs>